Good morning. I would like to start this morning the way we have started every week that I have had the honor to stand up here and address you. I would like to start with silent prayer as a community, as a church, one for another. So if you would bow your heads, close your eyes, and just pray for us as a body of Christ. Father God, we do not know the needs of the people here this morning, but you do. Burdens, whether they be financial, or whether they be physical, whether they be spiritual, Lord, we all have them. We're all imperfect. We struggle day in and day out in this world. Lord, I just pray that each need here is met according to your will. And Lord, soften our hearts one to another. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. Help us to be attentive and understanding to each other. Use us, Lord, as your servants to each other. It says in your word that they will know us by our love. Help us to live that. We thank you for all that you have done, the gift of your son, the grace and mercy that you show every day. Thank you, Lord, for this church, not the building, but the people, the people that you have surrounded us with to help us carry our loads, help us to share. We ask this in the precious name of your Son, the Christ. Amen. Today we continue a five-part series that we started called Sola Only. We talked about Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. We talked about grace alone. We talked about faith alone. And today we come to Solas Christos, in Christ alone. Our scripture for today will be found in Acts chapter 4. We'll be reading from verses 7 through 12, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. John Calvin says, Whoever is not satisfied with Christ alone strives after something beyond absolute perfection. Arthur W. Pink says that the great mistake made by most of the Lord's people is in hoping to discover in themselves that which is to be found in Christ alone. Scripture alone tells us that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Jesus, plus nothing, equals everything. Prior to Acts chapter 4, in Acts 3, Peter and John are going to the temple at the time of prayer, roughly 3 in the afternoon. There was a man that had been lame from birth, begging at the gate called Beautiful. When he asked Peter and John for money, they responded in a way that would change his life forever. Acts 3, verse 6, Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and his ankles became strong. So he jumped up, stood, and started to walk, and he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. 
All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. And while he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, greatly amazed, ran towards them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. The people were filled with astonishment. They were filled with amazement. And they ran to Solomon's Colonnade. And Peter began to explain the gospel to them. And members of the ruling council were there. And they became angry. And they became agitated. And they had Peter and John arrested and thrown into jail overnight. After the council had arrested them and they spent the night in jail, they had John and Peter appear before them the next morning. And this is where our scripture starts today. Acts 4, verse 7. After the council had Peter and John stand before them, they asked the question, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone despised by your builders, who has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Peter doesn't hold back. He said it was Jesus. The Jesus you crucified. The Jesus that God raised. It was by this man's name that he was healed. Following that, he quotes Psalm 118.22, where it says, The stone despised by you builders who has become the cornerstone. This is one of the most often Old Testament verses that are quoted in the New Testament. Three of the Gospels record Christ challenging the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders. He also warns them, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. That's Matthew 21, 44. The chief cornerstone of a building is foundational. It is vital to the erection of that building. It is the first and the most important stone laid. It guides, establishes, and stabilizes the erection. And in God's plan of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone. And that is what our faith should be founded on. It's the last words of Peter's mini-sermon that we're going to focus on today. Verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there was no other name under heaven given to the people by which we must be saved. We're going to look at the importance of salvation, the necessity of salvation, and the exclusiveness of salvation. Peter was an uneducated fisherman, and he stood fearlessly in front of the leaders of the day, standing his ground, stating truth. It was Jesus who you crucified. He stated that it is salvation that is the greatest need of mankind. And it's no different today. Salvation is still the greatest need of mankind. I went on the internet 
and I googled, and that's sometimes very dangerous to do, but I googled humanity's greatest need. And the first website that came up is something called Blue Sky, and it's based in the United Kingdom. And it lists the following most important human needs. First, and this is the order that they are given, number one, security. Knowing that financially you will be okay no matter what happens. The second one was confidence. Being able to press ahead with your life with a strong degree of positivity. Third, choice. Not feeling trapped on the treadmill of life and the ability to choose brings a sense of freedom. The fourth most important thing that you need is having pride in what you have created. The fifth most important thing is making a difference in whatever you're doing, helping others, and not being introspective. Next, the sense of belonging, having a strong feeling of connection to family. Stimulus, something to get excited about, like hobbies. Influencing, being able to influence matters in a positive way. Variety, and I quote, this is so important. All work and no play makes Jack a doll boy, as the saying goes. Finally, they get to faith in some kind of religion or a moral code. These are the 10 most important things mankind needs. Now, in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. But it truly misses the point that the most important thing we need is salvation. We need Jesus. Ephesians 2 told us that we were dead in our sins, defiant in our souls, and doomed to hell. If you remember, Romans 3 says that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, we're separated, and we were hopeless, and we are helpless to save ourselves. No amount of good works can ever rebuild that bridge of relationship between us and God. There's not enough. God is holy, he is just, and he cannot tolerate sin. And because of our sin, we have become objects of wrath. We are due the wrath of God. We need to be saved from that impending wrath. And we see this plan of action visible all the way back in Genesis. After Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit and had been cursed, God makes a very interesting prophecy when he curses the snake. He says in Genesis 3.15, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head. I'm sorry, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That verse is known as the Proto-Evangelium. Neat little theological term. Basically, it means that this is the first mention of the gospel in the Bible. The word for seed is zela. Now, some of your translations may have offspring. But that word zela is singular. It means one. One. One offspring whose heel will be bitten by the serpent. One offspring that will crush that serpent's head. God gave the Israelites a sacrificial system to remind them of this promise. When they would sin, an animal would die in its place. And the only problem with that is that it was temporary. Over and over, animals would be killed. Blood would be shed as a substitute for their sin. The only problem is it never ended. There was always a need for more sheep, and more goats, more doves, and more bulls. But then, prophets like Isaiah stepped up to the stage and announced that there would be a Messiah, a deliverer, a rescuer that would take away the sin of the people in a once and for all sacrifice. And then, a young Galilean rabbi stepped up. His name was Jesus. And John the Baptist heralded his coming as the Messiah, 
when in John 1.29, he said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God knew that only God could save us from God. So the second person of the Trinity took upon flesh. That debt that we owed was so great that only the person we owed it to could pay it. So Jesus satisfied the wrath of God upon the cross. Romans 5, 9 says that much more than, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. We just sang in that song, then on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Jesus was the sacrifice that paid for all of our sins. 1 John 4 it says that God's love was revealed among us in this way that God sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He loved us. Those three words were contrary to every religion in the day. The pagan gods of old, you owed them your love. You owed them your fealty. You owed them your loyalty. You had to love them. And if you remember some of the, the stories of the Greek gods and the Roman gods, there were trickster gods that would play tricks and rain havoc down upon your lives for their own joy. They enjoyed seeing you in misery and they enjoyed seeing you in pain. But this God, this God of the Jews, this God of the Gentiles, loved us. Totally different. He was the propitiation for our sins. Big word. Propitiation means, and I quote from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. It is the act of appeasing wrath. It is the atonement or atoning sacrifice offered to God to assuage his wrath. Jesus was our substitute, dying in our place. And all the wrath of God was laid upon him so that we could stand innocent before the throne. Hebrews 9, 12. He entered the Holy of Holies once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, who the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse our consciousness from the dead works to serve the living God. God sent his only son to die for us. Christ died for us. No one else. We needed a mediator as well. We needed someone to step between us and God. First Timothy tells us, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man. A man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now we're told in the book of James that we are to confess our sins one to another and pray for one another. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's encouraged for us to get together. We should confess our sins to another, to share. Like we, we prayed this morning, we're praying to hopefully share each other's burdens. 
We meet together to hold each other accountable. All has to do with confessing one to another. But there's only one mediator between God and man. We can confess our sins one to another, but we cannot forgive each other. Not to bash anyone. There's a process in the Catholic Church of confession where you go and you stand before the priest and you tell him your, your sins and, and he offers you absolution. And one means or another, you may have to say so many Hail Marys, you may have to perform an act of penance, but he offers you absolution for something that you do. We can't do that. We don't have the power to offer absolution to anyone. Only God can forgive sins. Mary and the saints are not mediators. For that matter, mediums and soothsayers, tarot and palm readers, astrological signs are not a link to the heavenly realms. Christ alone. No totem, no token, no idol of glass or wood or steel or metal can offer you forgiveness for your sins. Only God can do that. Salvation is by grace alone faith alone, in Christ alone. By his death on the cross, he reconciled us to God completely. Our sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. Second Corinthians says that he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The exclusiveness of salvation. One God, but many ways. I've shared the gospel over the years with a lot of different people. I've taught classes on, on cults and world religions and various different belief systems and worldviews and talked to people with various belief systems and worldviews. And one constant pretty much remains the same. There are many different ways to God, all of them equally valid. And if you are sincere enough, no matter your path, you will get to God and share in the reward. Imagine a wheel. Is it up there? Not yet. There she is. Imagine a wheel. On the outside of that wheel are people. That inside hub, that's God. And all those spokes, and we're missing one. And all those spokes are ways to God. And as long as you're sincere, no matter your path, you will share the reward. Me and Rob Morrison talked, it's been, I don't know how long ago, and we were talking about this same thing. And he said, no, 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 no. They're right. All paths do lead to God. I'm like, no. Yeah, I have to agree. He's right. Every single path leads to God. But the reward is not the same because they will be judged differently. As Christians, we will appear before the Bema Seat of Christ. Those who do not know God will stand before the great white throne judgment. So yes, all paths lead to God because everyone will stand accountable and everyone will give an account to their life to God. But the reward is not the same. The views of Jesus being only a good man and Jesus being God cannot both be true. 
It stands in contrast to the basic law of non-contradiction. I cannot look at a picture of the sun that is yellow and say it is yellow and have this gentleman here say that it is blue and we both be right. You can be sincerely wrong no matter how hard you believe in something. You can still be wrong. There's a story of an elephant. I don't know if it's still taught in colleges or not. But you have five blind men and they're brought up to an elephant. And the one is holding the ear and he says, oh, this is, this is a, a great fan. And another one is holding the leg and he's like, oh, this is a great trunk of a tree. Another one holds one of the tusks. This is a mighty spear. Someone leans against the side and he's talking about how solid of a wall it is. Another one holds the tail and says, oh, this is a rope. Each one fervently believing what their senses tell them. They sincerely believe it, but they're sincerely wrong. That story is generally told to present the concept that Whatever you believe is true is true. But my argument is if the blind men could see, they would see the truth. If they took off those scales that the devil has put over their eyes, they would see the truth. And the truth is, it's an elephant. You can be sincerely wrong. But Jesus didn't leave us the option to be sincerely wrong and choose whatever path we want simply because it's comfortable or what we believe. He said that his spoke was the only way and every single other spoke was wrong. If his way is truth, you can't have two truths and every other one is wrong. Let's take a look at Acts 4, verse 12 again. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Notice the salvation is found in no one else. So Peter affirms that salvation is through Jesus. He that was crucified and he that was raised from the dead. First Peter goes on to say in first Peter, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness by his wounding. You have been healed. When Jesus started talking about his impending death, the disciples needed a whole lot of reassurance. The disciples were a little dense sometimes and didn't understand a lot. He told them that he would prepare a place for them. And Thomas spoke up and said what everybody in that room was probably thinking. We don't know where you're going. So how in the, can we know the way? How can we follow you? Jesus' answer to this question takes away all doubts about the way to God. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am not a way. I am not the teacher of a way. I am the way. That is very plain and very simple. That's awfully narrow-minded, though. Come on. There's got to be other ones. The Bible tells us to love everyone. The Bible says that God loves everyone. Surely God would not send people to hell. But the simple answer to that question is by not choosing Christ, you are making a choice. And that choice leads to hell. 
God does not send you there. You choose to be there. Not making a choice is making a choice in itself. Matthew 7 says that to enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few will find it. It is through Christ alone, our only mediator, our only savior, our only hope. It is only through him that we can be saved. Maybe a better way to put it, when you get to the pearly gates, I don't know if Peter's going to be there with a book or not. I'm going to fall off here. When you get there, is it your resume or is it your referral that's going to get you in? My resume is not that great. And that brings us to our last part, the necessity of salvation. Again, we're going to look at Acts 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation. What is salvation? According to Webster's 1820, you can find everything in Webster's 1828 version. Salvation is preservation from destruction. Destruction. The wrath of God. Doesn't matter what continent under heaven you live on. You must be saved. Doesn't matter what race you are, what sex you are, what social status you may have, you must be saved. George Whitfield was approached by an old lady one day in one of his services. And she said, Why do you keep saying that I must be saved? And George Whitfield answered, Because you must be saved. It is a necessity. Without salvation, we face the wrath of a holy God. I cannot comprehend the torment in hell, a place that was originally reserved for Satan and his angels, is where eventually all unbelievers are going to end up for all of eternity. I can't fathom what that's going to be like. And there's a part of me that hopes I never can fathom what that's going to be like. Remember who Peter's talking to. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. The leaders of that day. They the politicians of today, Congress, the celebrities, the great corporate leaders. I don't care who you are. There is going to come a day where everyone bows their knee before Christ. If we are going to be saved, it has to come from outside of us. We need to be rescued. Martin Luther, whose pen started the Protestant Reformation, wrote, Since all of us born in sin and God's enemies have earned nothing but eternal wrath and hell, so that everything we are and can do is damned, and there is no help or way of getting out of this predicament. Therefore, another man had to step into our place, Jesus Christ, God and man, and had to render satisfaction and make payment for sin through his suffering and death. The writer of Hebrews posits a question. Hebrews 2, verse 3. How will we escape if we neglect 
such a great salvation. Think about it. How will we escape without such a great salvation? So what does this mean? Buddha's last words were to keep striving. Christ's last word, it is finished. The debt is paid. Salvation. It's important. We need a savior. Salvation. It's exclusive. There is no one and no way but Jesus. Salvation. It's necessary. God's wrath awaits us. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation?